Hello and welcome. This is the Bits vs. Byte podcast. I'm your host, Amar Grigic, and today with me is uh, David Hensel. Uh, he is uh, formerly the founder of uh, Max in the End, but uh, now is a serial entrepreneur with uh, stakes in multiple companies. So uh, welcome, David. Thank you for having me on the show, Amir. No problem at all. Uh, could you tell me a little bit about your uh, background and also uh, a little bit more about uh, Task Drive because that's one of the, the companies that you have a, have a stake in? Sure. So I'm originally from Germany and um, bringing this up because you pronounce my, my first name German. Everybody says David you know, yep. <laughs> these days and back in Germany it's David. Um, I had a few businesses in, in Germany, uh, like an e-commerce business and also um, like a support for local businesses on the tech side. So kind of maintaining in-house servers. It kind of dates me to, uh, showing how, you know, that when servers were still in the office building, which when there was no cloud, basically. And um, <clears throat> my big dream was always go to go to America because in Germany there was no real startup scene. I saw what was going on in, uh, on the west side uh, of the States and um, was really driven to go there. So I sold my e-commerce business in 2008, 2007 or 2008, and which gave me the capital to get my investor visa to move to the US. And this is where I co-founded MaxDN which we sold a little over three years ago. And um, after the sale, my wife wanted to move back to Germany, but I couldn't go back to German weather conditions after eight years off Los Angeles. And so we ended up moving <laughs> to the south of Turkey. And we're in Bodrum, Turkey now, which we really enjoy. And first I thought I'll do nothing, but then I got really bored. And now I have a small portfolio of businesses. Um, it's Task Drive, where we do lead research for basically to help SDRs, sales development reps, to be more efficient. LTP Plus, where we do um, provide live chat agents and customer experience agents for e-commerce stores. Shortlist.io, which provides backlinks and it's like your outsourced marketing team. And 50 SaaS, which is a dev shop for SaaS businesses, where we have like 50% of your SaaS is already built, is the tagline. And with this platform or with this startup, we have a few SaaS businesses. One of them is Referral Magic. Um, which is a referral marketing tool, and and it's, the list is longer, but I'll um, I'll stop here. <laughs> yeah, no problem. So uh, that's interesting to to hear that you moved to Turkey. So was that mainly because of the the climate, or was it uh, something else that also drew you there? Um, my wife has Turkish parents, ah. even though she's born in Germany. So when she, it was my decision to move to Los Angeles, I would have preferred to move further to Asia, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, it was my wife's turn to pick and happy <laughs> wife, happy life. So, yeah, exactly. You know, now, now we're here and it's, it's really awesome. It's the weather's amazing. The people are nice. The food is good. And the cost of living is a joke comparing to Los Angeles. So yeah. we're very happy here. Yeah, and, uh, I can, uh, well, what's, what's uh, kind of a, a question from my side on, on that one is, uh, so how, how's the kind of technological scene there? Because, uh, you, you have the portfolio. The startup of, scene? Yeah. Or for, for example, the startups <laughs> or the, the kind of technology companies that are there. So in Bodrum where I live, there's like next to nothing. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's interest, and actually, this weekend there's a there's a conference in Bodrum called Start Start in Bodrum, which is um, uh, a startup conference that is happening every year. I'm, I'm giving a talk there, mm -hmm. um, but uh, so it's it, it's very thin in terms of startups. Everybody here who is an entrepreneur has a hotel, a restaurant, a construction business, or something like this. Um, but yeah. Yeah, it's not a, that many tech people. Yeah, it's it's different. Yeah, and uh, it's interesting because you mentioned in the in the beginning that uh, that for example Germany that didn't have a kind of startup ecosystem at the time, mm -hmm. but uh, that that's really thriving right now. How do you look at that? Um, the weather still sucks in Germany. <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's true. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, uh, here in Turkey in Istanbul, there's also a very thriving tech scene. Mm -hmm. There's a lot going on. But yeah, it's it's also too cold in Istanbul and too too hectic. Yeah, yeah. I, I still I travel a lot. I go to lots of conferences. I'm going to um, SAS Talk next week, which I really enjoy. It's a really cool conference in, I think, my favorite European tech conference yeah. in Dublin next week. And um, yeah, I, I travel a lot for business, so I still get exposure to 
people who are in the same mindset as, as I'm. Yeah, for sure. So uh, to get back to to for example task drive because uh, that's one of the th- things that you were uh, that you you have a stake in. So uh, could you tell a little bit about more uh, more about that? Uh, w- what it actually is and what kind of service it tries to provide? Sure. So um, we help SDR sales development reps to be more efficient. There is a book called Predictable Revenue by Aaron Ross, which you released like nine years ago or so, which takes the sales guy's position and splits it into three different disciplines. The first discipline is the SDR, sales development rep, who's kind of reaching out to new potential prospects. And then the closer who will have a call with these prospects and close them. And then the account executive who will then match them from uh, ongoing from there. So people can really focus only on one thing because when one person does everything, it doesn't really work because like, you know, you prospect a lot, then you have a few people you talk to and then you work on closing them and then you you close them or they, they, they fall through and then you have no pipeline anymore. And by splitting this up into these three disciplines, it becomes very efficient if you, if for, for B2B sales. Um, mm-hmm. And we basically introduced the fourth discipline, which is the researcher. So our researchers, um, Find people that fit your ICP, your ideal customer profile, and find some nugget of information that make the outreach actually stick. So it's, you know, because a lot of people do outreach these days and you have to kind of be very targeted Mm -hmm. um, and and have some customization in the the outreach message to actually break through the noise. And this is what we do. So we have a a team in the Philippines and in the Ukraine that is um, providing these services. Yeah, yeah. So it's it, it, yeah. Is is it kind of uh, you wanted to say it? I think, but uh, is it kind of uh, looking more for for like better leads, right? Instead of just shooting at everybody that has a company or whatever. Yeah, so you, know, you can buy lists. So there's like a bunch of tools out there how you can compile lists mm-hmm. of prospects. You know, you say you're going after CTOs of companies of of this size who are in this region of the world, but this doesn't really work anymore. But if you have like more if you dig a little deeper and you kind of figure out like where these CTOs have been speaking or um, which podcasts they were on, and then you reach out to them saying like, hey, I listened to this episode, podcast episode of Blah. I really like what you said here and there. Um, by the way, I'm, I'm David. I do this and this and this. I would like to talk to you about X. Ah, then you okay. have a much higher chance of getting through to them versus like, hey, I'm David. Buy my stuff. You know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's for example <coughs> one one area that uh, uh, that I'm uh, that I get like spammed a lo- about a lot in yes. on LinkedIn is is for example the software development side, right? Where, where you have the we the, are a development shop. Like, yeah. don't you want to? Yeah. You know. Yeah, exactly. So uh, people from the Ukraine and uh, and the kind of Baltic states and and of course the Balkans as well. Uh, where y- you, yeah, you get you get a message at least like two or three times a week, even though you, in the bio it says don't <laughs> don't uh, yeah, don't, send, yeah. don't send me a connection request for that because I'm not I'm not gonna accept it. But they still try mm-hmm. it. I, I get why they still try it. But if if you see that's uh, if you see that line, you would probably say yeah, okay, that's not going to be it. So someone else said that uh, correctly uh, as well that a while ago where where they were like. Okay, maybe you should first like send a connection request to follow someone and to see actually what they're doing and stuff like that and then yeah. engage. Yeah, kind of build some trust, you know, yeah. like follow him, comment on his stuff, like his stuff that he puts out there. Yeah. Uh, you know, and then they kind of know you and then kind of reach out to like, oh, I saw this article that you shared about blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Actually, we're doing this and this, you know, like then it's like more like, hey, this, this, you've seen this person a few times, you know, or, or follow him on LinkedIn, then follow him on Twitter like his stuff, share his stuff, and then comment on something and then kind of reach out afterwards. So there's like some familiar familiarity yeah. versus like some dude just like pray and spray and just like, you know, hitting up everybody. Yeah, that makes more sense. I mean, uh, for me as well, where um, if someone is like following me, for example, on LinkedIn and uh, is liking the posts and actually engaging with it, I'm much more receptive to to answer your message than afterwards. Uh, if you send me a message and say, "Okay, uh, I want to know more about this, what you, what you were posting," I, I don't want to sell you anything right now, but it could be that some somewhere down the line, I have something interesting for you. Yes, or you can do other outreach that works well. Like, if I, for example, I'm doing a roundup posts asking CTOs about 
topic X mm-hmm. and I'd like to just like talk to you for five minutes uh, for, for 10 minutes, get your opinion. And then we will put this into a post and we'll give you a backlink. So yeah. like some exposure, yeah. but then you kind of provide value upfront for this person. And then while doing this, they get to know you and then, you know, maybe something further down the line happens, but it's not just like the blunt yeah. buy my stuff. Thing, yeah, exactly. which doesn't work anymore. Exactly. So, um, what I wanted to ask is um, uh, to get back to that that moving uh, around a little bit. So, uh, you you are originally from Germany. You went to the States. You're now in Turkey. Uh, it, when we look at the the kind of uh, the, the the differences between companies in those countries, uh, how do you uh, how do you see how do you see those? Are are there, are there big differences in like uh, organizational structures, cultures, and stuff like that? How, how do you how do you view that? I mean, there's there's massive differences, and I can't speak for working in a big company or like in a Fortune 500 company sure. or something like yeah. this. I can just like talk about the the startup world. Um, one big difference is then. I'm not sure if it's shifting right now, but like the in, uh, in in Germany, it was kind of weird being an entrepreneur back mm-hmm. then. You know, it's like oh, everybody is like more of like being safe and making sure you have like this predictable job where you can't get fired type of thing, and it's guaranteed that you're going to make money. Risk versus <laughs> risk free, yeah. yeah, yeah. In America, people are more open to risk, mm-hmm. and um, also like it's it's. Um, it's okay to fail versus like in, in, in Germany, if you fail at something, then, you know, you kind of burned and people, you know, kind of give you shit about this forever versus, yeah. you know, but also, yeah, that, that, that's one big difference. Another big difference is the social system in, in Germany and the social system in the States. Um, you can just like fire people without, you know, it's like, okay, uh, this person doesn't work out that we'll let them go versus in, America, in Germany, if you have like over 10 employees, it's super hard to fire somebody. Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah and um, it, it's also with the agreements, right? Where if if I look at a perspective from from the Netherlands, where it's also a little bit, I think, comparable to Germany in some cases, mm-hmm. uh, where, for example, you get uh, first you get a, like a temporary uh, contract with, with, that you're working on, for example, for a year or something like that. You can extend that with a year. And then I think you can extend it one more time, and after that you, and then have, you have to hire. Yeah, yeah, you you really have to have to have them on a kind of permanent contract, uh, and mm-hmm. after that it's really really hard to actually fire someone because there needs to be real grounds to do that, right? Uh, so, for example, of course, if someone steals from you, that's a different thing, right? You can actually pretty much get that uh, get that out of the way quickly. But if you if you don't have that, you really need to have a good. Well, it's not a kind of severance thing because y- you need to have that severance package in place anyway. But uh, in the states, you d- yeah. don't really like if you're a small company, you don't really have to give much severance. And yeah. severance is like two weeks or a month of salary. Yeah, you know, and here, here kind of. it's actually I think even uh, based upon uh, how many years you've worked at the yes. company. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yep. And that's and that's really it's really different uh, to 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 the states. I can I can imagine. Um, so On vacation days in 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 the states, you. I don't know what's a mandatory, like maybe ten days is mandatory or like not even. So that's that's crazy. I, I didn't even know and, that, but that's that's and really then if low. You, <laughs> yeah, but and hear me out, like and you have two sick days. Mm. And if you have, you know, let's say you've been sick for five days, then you only have seven vacation days left. Mm. And if you're sick for like if you have no more vacation days and you're sick, you don't get money. That's crazy. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it, you can't imagine it from from, from my perspective. The European course. standpoint, yeah. yeah. European yeah. standpoint. In Germany, it's like, oh yeah, I don't feel well. I just go to the doctor, stay at home for two weeks. You know, yeah. like this will not fly in the states. Yeah, it's not. It's not even a big deal in in that case. Uh, and it it's all paid and everything like that. Um, mm-hmm. And it, it it doesn't go from your vacation days. Yeah, that, that's those are those are like really big things. I think that are different. Uh, but as you said, the the kind of risk taking is uh, is one thing that I've noticed as well. Where uh, we as if I can call it we as Europeans, <laughs> mm-hmm. but uh, but you, you see that the 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 big difference there is that we we, uh, we kind of try to we we don't dream big if you can if you yes. know what I mean. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, that's the that's the big thing I think that uh, we we do wrong if we can call it like a we but you, you know what i mean uh, oh yeah absolutely in america is like you can do anything you want to do yay you know like and versus like in, in in europe it's like yeah just kind of stick with what you know and don't 
don't don't attempt to do something. Yeah, yeah. Is that also one of the the reasons uh, why that move to the United States was some so interesting to you? Um, maybe subconsciously. Like the main thing for me was the the startup scene, the opportunity, and I had really good friends in Los Angeles. And when I was in Los Angeles for the first time, I knew I'm going to move there at some point. I just knew mm. it, and so I, you know, yes. It's it's more, yeah I, I can I can imagine that w- that's one of the one of the things. Um, so uh, what what I was wondering about I I listened to another podcast you did I'm I'm not sure of the name what it was again but uh, th- there was one thing that I I that was in there that was interesting to me because I have kind of the same thing. So uh, to to get into kind of education a little bit so the the mm-hmm. the, the schools and stuff like that uh, you you mentioned that you were really weren't into like going to school and stuff like that uh mm-hmm. so c- could you tell a little bit more about that because i i had the kind of same thing c- could you explain a little bit about that sure sure so um i went to 14 different schools total and then at some point i just dropped out and start started my first business um and i thought a lot about this like why this was the case because when i had a teacher that i liked I had straight A's, and if I had a teacher I didn't like, I had like you know F's, or I just didn't show up. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm a big believer that every decision in life you make is either out of love or out of fear. And if you make them out of love, you're on the right path, you're in, in the flow, and things will work. And if you do them out of fear, it's 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 not really working. And if you learn out of love because you like the topic, you like the environment, you like the teacher then you soak up information like crazy versus mm-hmm. if you just do it because you're scared of getting bad grades or whatever or pressure from your parents then you're acting out of fear and then it will not work yeah exactly you know same in if if i want to sell you something and i'm selling this product out of love because i know this product is a good product and it's going to help you to do your business better or to whatever help you in your life then i can be a pushy sales guy and you will feel where i'm coming from that i'm doing this with love and that i have your best interest in mind versus if the predominant thought in my mind is fear and fear of like oh i have to reach my numbers oh i have to pay my mortgage and this is your the dominating force behind this the other person the person on the other side will also feel this and less likely buy yeah yeah and i i I completely agree because i i can remember the 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 classes or actually i can remember the teachers that were uh were instrumental right where where you were like okay this is this is a class where i was really engaged just because the teacher was so good at uh, Mm -hmm. doing their thing instead of just saying you you need to do this and this and this they uh, for example i had a history teacher that was really good at telling the stories right telling the stories that from the kind of history thing I, of course history is interesting to me so i have that extra thing that i wanted to to listen to it but uh i think that that's something that's kind of missing in the the school system as well is that uh, you start off like really broad uh, at least in the in the dutch system where you look at, you look at things like really blo- broadly you get all kinds of uh, classes that may may or may not interest you at all uh that's also i think the reason why uh, I gravitated towards a, a school where it was more based on IT because that's something that I mm. enjoyed. That's uh, your thing. Yeah. There's this thing called unschooling. You mm-hmm. know, it's not, it's not homeschooling where you follow the curriculum of the of the system where you live. Um, unschooling is you just let the kid focus on whatever the kid wants to focus on. If he wants to focus on history, just like let him, let him or her nerd out on history. Now it's interested in dinosaurs, let them focus on dinosaurs. Now it's interested in whatever. So basically mm-hmm. only that they could focus on whatever it wants to focus on. And we want to do this with our daughter, um, just like hire a tutor who is just guiding her and helping her and providing her whatever she wants to learn or focus on. Yeah. Um, but she really wanted to go to school because her friends from, from preschool went to school. So she just started going to a school here. So let's see how it goes. Yeah, yeah that's interesting. I, I didn't know about that concept uh, because that's, uh, that seems to me like, um, it kind of seems like a kind of mentoring, uh, in a, a kind of mentoring role. So you would have someone mm-hmm. that's a, a tutor that, of course, knows some stuff about uh, different topics, but is more of a mentor in guiding like, okay, 
what are kind of the things that actually interest you? And that's hard for a kid as well to 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 define, of course. But you you I, have I don't think favorites. so. You just like expose them to some stuff. You just mm. uh, you know my my daughter. We just like read this book called Rosie Revere Engineer. It's like some little girl who built stuff out of out of garbage and like mm-hmm. built some whatever tools out of it and then um, some gadgets. And she was so, and it was like a bedtime story. And she was so fascinated with this. She now, now this weekend, we're going to build stuff. And, you know, she wants to build, what does she want to build? A cleaning machine, whatever that means. So we just like <laughs> go, on, go on YouTube and search for DIY cleaning machine. And we just like, yeah, look through the videos and we pick one. And this is what we're going to build this weekend. Yeah. You know, yeah. So I think like through stuff like this, kids, kids will tell you if you expose them to stuff, what they like and what they don't like. Yeah, yeah, that's true because they they are going to be uh they are going to be really honest about what they do and yes. do not like. That's the that's the cool thing about it, and I think that um you tr- you have to try to capture that uh, and also keep them curious because that's that's the thing that uh, I think uh, a lot of the kind of if I can call it the traditional school system tr- is is not that that's good at. Yeah. Is keeping mm-hmm. the keep the the kids curious about all these kinds of different topics, right? Yeah, I think you know the school system. I think was was made the f- the current form, or it hasn't really changed in a long time, and it was made to produce factory workers and sure. um, and soldiers. This is like the you know people who can follow orders, not think outside of the box, not complain, you know, do what the man tells them to do. And um, yeah, I don't want that from my daughter. No, and I, I think that uh, a lot of the work that is being done in the in the world right now isn't like that anymore. Of course, there are still mm-hmm. factories and stuff like that. But uh, when you look at the kind of, um, if you can call it developed countries, I, I, I kind of dislike that word. But uh, it, it's more uh, going towards that kind of creative work, uh, development. Yes, stuff very like much that. so, yeah. Yeah. And I think that that uh, that requires some different schooling to to uh, for kids and uh, and and actually adults as well, uh, where some people are still interested in in learning new stuff. Uh, oh, I, I consume like two books a month. Yeah, I'm con- continue always learning stuff. I really I enjoy that. Yeah, you know, I think if you stop growing, then you're dying. Yeah, if a business is not growing anymore, it's dying. If a tree is not growing anymore, it's dying. If your relationship with your spouse is not growing anymore, it's dying. Yeah, you know, it's being stale. So we always have this urge. As if you're, yeah, if you're awake and if you're growing, then you want to grow in all aspects of your life all the yeah. time. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, I completely agree with that. I, I was uh, listening to a webinar. I think it, two weeks ago or something like that. It was about a topic that I, I kind of in, I'm interested in. And I was like, okay, maybe I'm not going to know something really new from this webinar, but I can still, uh, even if it's that 1%, uh, I actually mm-hmm. talked about it in the last podcast that I did as well. Uh, even if it's that 1% better, that's already already something, right? It's Big already improvement. something. Yeah. So one of the uh, one of the things that we uh, when we were talking about uh, doing this podcast uh, uh, when we were talking over email, uh, you mentioned also to that you like to kind of nerd out about uh, about multiple things like mission, vision, and other things related to that. Mm-hmm. Uh, c- could you tell me about why you why you love those those topics so much? So I love them so much. I love you know having a defined company vision and mission and core values. Because I used to think it's complete bullshit that nobody needs this. It's like a complete waste of time. It's stuff you put into a deck when you want to raise money and then you put bury it somewhere on your website and you never look at it again. And um, this was used to be my belief, but um, with, with Max CDN, we initially had a company vision or an idea of what we want to do. We wanted to make CDN as easy to use as possible and accessible for everybody. Because back in the days, um, you know, you had to go to Akamai or to Limelight to one of the big players. It was like an enterprise play to use CDN. You had to do the sales game dance, kind of, you know, get a quote and back and forth. And they try to put you into an annual or two-year contract, and it's a minimum of five hundred dollars a month. And this was just not feasible for all the startups out there um, to make these types of commitments. So we thought, okay, let's change this and make it as accessible as possible for everybody. And this worked really, really well. And we grew really fast, but we messed up by not telling everybody 
what we're about, like who we're serving and why we're serving, you know, what, what our goal is and, and, you know, what is our vision, where we want to go and what's our mission, what we do to get there. Um, and so we hired a new head of sales who was running after enterprise accounts, even though this was not our focus. We hired a new um, head of engineering who came from Splunk and he built this crazy data analytics engine on top of the CDN, which was really cool, but only for 5% of our customers. Mm. You know, so we started running into 10 different directions and nothing worked anymore at some point. Uh, and then we realized that this was the reason why this happened. And then we you know, kind of sat down and figured out our mission, vision, values again, and then we took off again. Yeah. So this is why I had this, you know, this big aha moment. Yeah. This yeah. is why I'm I, so passionate about this. I can I can imagine because that um, that's ultimately the the thing that the that of course your employees and uh, the people working at the company get behind, right? Uh, and you you notice that if it isn't there, uh, and well, sometimes it even happens that it's there, but people don't believe in it. But that's a different story. But uh, if, if it's it not isn't, only that, yeah, it's not only that. It's not only like if you want to get people behind the mission in terms of to recruit them or make them feel good about what they're doing. Yeah, it's also your decision filter. Mm. You know, for example, yeah, a friend of mine started Ring.com. It's like a you know this this doorbell, and then you can. It's like a used to be called doorbot when you ring. Mm -hmm. The doorbell, um, it rings on your phone, and then you can see who, by a video stream who's in front of the door, and you can either talk to them or let them in or not. Um, and he sold to Amazon for over a billion dollars. Um, and uh, they also have this floodlight tool, which you put on the side of the house. Uh, you know, it's a camera, microphone, and um, speaker, and two big floodlights. And one engineer came to him and said, like, hey, we could use this thing and program a mode where the microphone is listening to music and the lights are flashing to music right, to the beat and he could just tell them like hey that's a stupid idea and we're not doing this but he said what does this have to do with our with our vision which is to make neighborhoods safer mm. right? and then so <clears throat> and then you know if you have this vision mission values and you use it as a management tool like that we explain your decisions then everybody in the organization can make decisions the same way you would make them. And it reduces the management involvement massively. If you, know, if you have like a thousand people all, you know, you have like a mission, we, want, we all want to conquer this hill and we want to do X, Y, Z to conquer this hill versus like just a thousand people running around like crazy people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's the thing. Uh, and I, I think that question of oh, why are we doing this or why are we uh, doing this and what does it have to do with what we have in mind as a, a plan? Uh, that's a really good one because, um, it, for example, if we if I take the the example of what uh, we were doing at Tevreden.nl uh, as well, is we're building an application and we're looking at okay. But what are we actually? So are we just a data source to other companies for things that they don't know right now? Or are we more than that? Are we kind of an analytical company? That, that Those are all kinds of things that we asked ourselves. And in the end, it probably will be that we are a data source for other companies. And we shouldn't focus anymore on being and a data company and a kind of analytical company that we have a dashboard and everything like that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's because you can only do one thing really well. It's yeah. really hard to do like ten things really well. Exactly, and that's the 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 kind of now it's not a mistake, but it, it's it's something that we've learned from along the uh, along the way, where we're like, okay, but we try to do all these kind of things, but we we kind of notice that we need to integrate more with other pro products to get to get that value, that extra value, but not build it ourselves anymore, right? If you need a narrow you costing just, solution, you're not going to build it yourself, for example. Yep, yep. Um, you, you used the word try like five or six times already in, in yeah. our call. And I'm on, on, on a personal mission to remove this word from any language. Mm -hmm. um, because I think trying is the most inefficient way not to do something. You know, like, oh, I try to quit smoking. I try to lose weight. Like, either do it or don't. You know, either enjoy cigarettes or stop putting them into your mouth. That makes sense. <laughs> uh, same with, you know, if you do something, it was every time when some of my, well, somebody who reports to me says, I give him a task and I say, well, we're going to try. I send him the Yoda video of Luke and Yoda where he says like, do or do not. There is no try. Mm. Um, and also from an NLP standpoint, you know, NLP, yep. neuro linguistic sure. programming. Yeah. 
you program yourself to fail, um, you know, because you say like, you're not, you're not really meaning it. And also kind of going back to the love and fear thing. If you try something, you're afraid that you're going to fail or you think mm -hmm. you won't make it versus like, I'm going to fucking do this. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's yeah. like a very, I'm, I'm a firm believer that this has a giant impact in your life. Mm. If you watch your languages, your language, you know, yeah, like how you talk to others sense. and how you talk to yourself. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I, I didn't think about it like that because this is just something that is, uh, it, it kind of, um, it kind of gets in there, even though you don't. It's subconscious, right? It's subconscious mm -hmm. where, where you're like, uh, oh yeah, I'm, I'm gonna try to do that, and, and, and in the other way, you're like, yeah, I'm just gonna do it, but uh, no, the I, outcome, can, I, outcome can I'm be. I'm going different. to try. Yeah, I'm going to try to pick up my mom from the airport. It's like, you won't fucking do this. Right? Yeah, no, 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 like, no. You know, you're going to pick going up to. from the airport. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, so it's like yeah. just like a, you. The only way, the only appropriate use for the word is like oh, i'm going to try this piece of cake to see if it's good mm. but anything else should not be uh yeah i'm i'm annoying everybody with this so <laughs> no it's it it's, again, it's, you, it's good it's it's actually good because um i didn't even notice it myself uh, until you said it right and that's the and you're gonna the you're probably gonna use it two or three more times during this interview for sure and I'll, <laughs> I'll, no, I'll, no, I'll, I'll, I'll point it out <laughs> i'm looking at it right I, i'm kind of trying uh, here it was again. <laughs> nah. Boom! But it's 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 so, actually also, interesting. Another thing in terms of using the using words mm. um, in the business, I would never say like we have to do this or we must do this. I only say we we want to do this because yeah. like have to also feel feels bad, right? And also the only thing I have to do is like die at some point. Mm -hmm. But if you want this, you know, like I want to do my homework. I don't have to. If I have to do my homework, it's it's shitty. But if I want to do my homework because I enjoy the topic, it's a very different game. Yeah, I I think Dutch like Dutch people say it a lot. They actually say it like uh, in a, in a way like, uh, yeah, I don't have to do anything. <laughs> I, I, I I I want to do anything, something, and that yeah. that makes sense. I mean, it it, it has a, a negative connotation, right? Where it's like, oh, I have to do this uh, or something yep. like that. Yeah, that makes sense. So. Uh, to to uh, get back to s some other stuff like the because you're you've been in the startup world uh, a long time uh, so you you can see this kind of uh, move towards these kind of hyper growth startups right where they're mm -hmm. like uh, growing like crazy and uh, and sometimes uh, you're like uh, is this really healthy to grow that fast um mm -hmm. so how do you how do you look at that so how do you look at that kind of startup wor startup world that's uh, that's evolving right now to towards that is that do you feel it's like it's a good thing or should we maybe do some things different in that kind of startup uh, environment I mean, it really depends on in which category of business you're in mm -hmm. if you have to uh, kind of like if it's a winner takes it all situation and you have to kind of do like the land grab thing and um you need lots of capital to to secure this. You know, it's also I think like it really breaks down to what do you want personally? You know, kind of like what do your life want to look like? You know, I think that's like something that a lot of people also don't ask themselves. Um, my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer six years ago or so. Oh, really? Look on wood today, she's good. Um, but when this happened, I kind of imagined myself laying on my deathbed, looking back at my life, thinking, did I really do what I was supposed to do? Did I have the impact I want to have? Mm. Basically, did I live the life that I want to live? And I think this is like kind of where I would start with like, you know, with, with all startups. Like, do I, you know, do I know what I really want to do here? Um, and then kind of make a decision based on this, like, do I want to have a... Uh, a lifestyle business or do i want to do something that's really over the moon that you know has this giant impact in the world and maybe needs lots of um lots of cash or like vc money to to do this um and you know something is also irritating because i think like the startups are the new rock bands people want to do this to become rich and famous yeah that's like the motivation behind it you know and i think uh and people also often lose the. I'm a firm believer that money is a side effect of providing value. So if you figure out how to provide lots of value to lots of people, then you'll be the richest dude around. Exactly. And you know, if you just focus on money, it's it's it's. I think it's not not the right, right move. 
No. And that, that makes that makes sense. I, I actually always say that as well, where I'm like, okay, but you started, for example, if you start a company, right, you're starting it with a goal in mind or something, at least mm-hmm. something that you want to achieve, right? And what you see is that along the way, that kind of goal, uh, it kind of, it's not that it d- disappears. It, it, of course, it moves and, uh, and stuff like that, but it's, it's, it's um, it it gets out of sight, right? And people start focusing on. Of course, you need to pay the bills and stuff like that. That that makes sense. Uh, but uh, there is one uh, inherent thing why you started this, uh, and uh, I think that that that's stronger, and uh, people believe more in that than just oh yeah, we are going to make a lot of money, right? And that's the that's mm-hmm. the thing. I think that's the that's the big the just big growing thing. for the sake of growing. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Like to be able to say, oh, we're in 100 different countries or something like that, right? Mm. Instead of, it's, it's just status signaling in that, in that sense, uh, where, where they're like, ah, we're, we're in 100 different countries, we have all this VC money coming in. Uh, and I'm also, like, it's yeah. a funny thing. People like to brag with how much money they raised. Yeah, yeah. Kind of like similar weird. To, it's <laughs> like bragging like how much mortgage I have on my house. Yeah. Makes, doesn't make, like, doesn't make sense at all. Well, why why would I what why would I be flaunting with that, right? Yeah, yeah. It, it's of course. Uh, I've, I've uh, I was listening to a podcast with uh, Jason Fried about this as well. He was talking about this as well, uh, where he was like, yeah, uh, he was talking about Uber, for example. Well, uh, mm-hmm. th- those are kind of the 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 companies that are actually not performing that well right they're losing money mm-hmm. all the time and still there are a lot of people putting in money into it uh, because they somehow or another uh, still want to invest in this in this company although they see that it's failing right and that's something that that i've noticed as well where as you said a lot of people are like oh yeah we, ma- we raised 20 million dollars yeah okay whatever <laughs> you know mm-hmm. uh is that it's also, it, you know, I, I also have to say, like, I never raised money. I always worked with money that I made from a previous business. Mm. I always bootstrapped everything. Cool. So I'm also, you know, not the, the best person to give advice on this. Like with Maxian, we had two competitors who started after us who just IPO'd, you know, so this could have, you know, we could have also made lots more money if we would have, or potentially made lots more money if we would have raised money. Yeah. But, you know, it's also personal preference on what kind of experience you want to have in your life. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Want, like, yeah. Also, I never want to have a boss, so I guess that's <laughs> Yeah, that that, that makes sense. Well. Than, yeah. Yeah. You haven't invested and in, you kinda of have a boss and it's also like it's I don't know, like doing the bootstraps things thing for so long, it feels really irritating to burn lots of money every month. For and, sure. You know, kinda of knowing like, oh we have only like six month more run rate and now we have to kinda of raise more money to keep on going. It's like uh, just something I would not enjoy. Yeah, uh, I can imagine, but you can you can tell that from experience. I think <coughs> uh, I th- I can imagine that the gratification is also different, right? Right, when you do it all by yourself and and put in all those hours and all the the work into it, right? Mm, yeah, potentially. I never had the other experience. Yeah, but I think like, if if you raise money, you, you still think you still do it by yourself because you you're still doing the work. Somebody else just gives you money, but you kind of still do the hard work. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, w- when we uh, look at that kind of hyper growth and stuff like that, uh, there's also a question of um, if you're go- growing that fast, h- how do you kind of prevent uh, the business outgrowing your? Because I can imagine, uh, I, I don't know the growth path, for example, that you had with Max CDN, but I can imagine that that growth path was pretty, uh, pretty, it was pretty rapid. Yeah. 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 H- how do you how do you keep up with that? I think it's it really breaks down to cultivating good habits. I'm a firm believer that habits determine everything in your life. If you are successful or unsuccessful, obese or in shape, um, happy or unhappy, it kind of all you know goes back to the habits that you cultivate. If you have a proper morning routine, you take good care of yourself. You know, because it's like a it's it's a marathon, not a sprint. So you have to kind of you know work out on a regular basis. Meditation helps me tremendously like richly always planning my day in the morning, picking out what's the most important thing that I want to, do, to work on. Having like a three-year three year plan, one-year plan, and 90-day plan with the, you know, so I can judge like, what do I really want to work on now? What's the stuff that moves the needle? And um, yeah, I think it really breaks, comes, comes down to cultivating the right habits so you can stay on top and also kind of evolving 
for me, one big thing was to become more outgoing and becoming less of an introvert. I used to be fairly introverted. I was uncomfortable being on a conference call, for example. Mm. I always thought like, oh, do people think I have a weird accent? Do they think, oh, people think what I'm, what I'm saying is stupid or whatever, right? And um, it was also coming from a from place of fear. Uh, and I used to do Toastmasters twice a week. This, uh, do you know Toastmasters? Yeah, it's for the public speaking, right? Yeah, public speaking stuff, public speaking groups. It's, it's really awesome. It's a lot of fun too. And I did, um, I went to two networking events per week in Los Angeles. That's easy. Turkey and Bodrum is really hard, but I just, I went to two tech networking events and talked to everybody and their mom until I came, overcame that fear. Um, but the big thing was again, the, the love and fear thing. Like once I realized it's like, if I make it about the other person, um, and not about me, then it becomes super simple, you know, then the, the fear turns into love. Like if I make it about me, like, oh, do they think I'm weird? Versus like, oh, there's a new person. Let me see how I can provide value to that person. Yeah. Same with public speaking. If I go on stage and oh, back in the days, I would have never gone on stage ever. Um, but now when I go up, I think like, oh, what I have to say here can potentially help these people. Um, and then I'm acting out of love and it's very easy versus if I act out of fear and I think about like, oh, do they think I'm weird? Do they think what I'm saying is stupid? Then I can't perform and I can't give a good presentation. Yeah, and that makes sense. So, so one thing I wanted to ask you because that's something that um, I've been working on the last few years as well, the, the public speaking part and mm -hmm. uh, and being more. Well, I, I I wasn't really an introvert, but I did have that kind of those kind of traits, right? Where uh, uh, in large groups, I was kind of a bit uncomfortable and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so f for you, what what kind of helped to to get over that kind of that kind of to make that step right to do this kind of thing to to get more uh, into these um into these networking events or uh, doing that public speaking what are some of the the steps to, that you took for that um meditation definitely helps also I'm, I'm not doing it anymore but before before like uh speaking in front of more people i just kind of go away somewhere to a quiet quiet location and just breathe deeply for 10 minutes mm -hmm. this helped me tremendously um, and just like the realization, like if I feel fear creeping up, just like take a deep breath and think about like, oh, what I'm doing here can help these people to do whatever topic is I'm talking about, do better in their lives. And this is like the switch in my mind that, that flipped over. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. The 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 the, the things, uh, for example, that I did also with the for when we look at the public speaking, uh, I was also I was also like, okay, let me start small, right, with people that I know. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, uh, you could have maybe the same thing, but uh, you have the uh, you have your company where what you that you're working in right now, uh, and and try and present something about. Actually, yeah, that's What's a good point. Yeah. We, we did this too. We had like um, monthly town hall meetings where the entire company came together and each department had always gave an update on like what's going on, what we plan, what we accomplished, what we're going to do next month and giving some shout outs to people in the business that did a good job based on our core values. Um, this also, yeah, actually helped tremendously. It's a good point. Yeah, and I, that that um, that helped me a lot because I was like, yeah, what's the worst that can happen with people that I already work with on a daily basis, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe I maybe I flunk and I, it doesn't really go well, but uh, at least I did it, right? At least you yep. st stood up and you actually did the work. Uh, Exposure and, therapy. Yeah. Yeah, it's like uh, it's it's it happens with uh, a lot of fears that people have. Where uh, uh, unless you do it and uh, and try try here it is again. <laughs> <laughs> unless you do it, <laughs> I'm not going to use try again. Uh, but uh, unless you do it, you, you you won't know how it is. Uh, you, mm -hmm. People are like in fear uh, because they did it before. Uh, for example, speaking in front of class or whatever, uh, and they didn't do well, then they are automatically like, okay, uh, I don't really like that feeling, so I don't want to expose myself to it again. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's yeah, the exposure, only way you can like, you just, like, just, just do it. Also, like, a, a big thing is that most people, like, it's not that big of a deal, even if you mess up or something like this. People are way more focused on themselves versus like, you know, if you mess up on stage, you probably have forgotten this in like five minutes after they walked out of the room. Yep. You know, it's a, another thing that, that helped me tremendously is like, I have this gratitude rock 
in my pocket that I pick up every morning with my keys and my wallet. Mm-hmm. And when I pick it up, I go through the things I'm grateful for. You know, my healthy body, my wife, my daughter, um, friends, business, colleagues, blah, long list, right? Our seven dogs. We have seven dogs, by the way, random fact. Oh, <laughs> random um, fact. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, 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 and so, that makes sense. But by doing this, it brings me to an all as well state of mind mm. um, versus like we always tend to focus on the big problem of the moment and we kind of forget how much beauty we have in our life. Yeah. You know, you just like focus on, oh, this thing in business is not going well, life sucks. Versus like, oh, you forget how much beauty you actually have. And by being in the state of gratitude, you actually have way more energy to plow through these issues because like, you know, the, the big problem of the moment, you probably won't even remember six months from now. Yeah. This is also something that helped me tremendously to just be more in the now versus like, you know, all, all Eckhart Tolle power of now, I don't know if you read it. Yeah. All anxiety comes from thoughts of the future. And all anger is thoughts of the past. And if you manage to just like be in the present moment, everything becomes much easier. Yeah, makes sense because it 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 reminds me of uh, when yeah it, it, that makes total sense to me because we're kind of conditioned on uh, to always look at the things that are negative, right? Uh, all the if there if everything is all right, and uh, for example, a client is uh, being if you can call it quote unquote annoying <laughs> then uh, <laughs> you you start to focus on that instead of just looking at the positive things that there are, are there right you have yes. a company you have a you have clients that's that's already you have a healthy you have a healthy body you have a yeah. roof over your house you have enough to eat for a foreseeable future this is already everything else is kind of gravy yeah it's right? it's all also extra like, with the stone when i pick it take it out at the end of the day out of my pocket this is what i do i go through the things that went great this day, because often you have like a productive morning, everything's good, but at 5 p.m. you have an unpleasant conversation with this annoying customer you just mentioned, or with a teammate, or you had to fire somebody, or some drama with your spouse or whatever, and you think everything sucks, but did not because there was like so much good stuff going on as well. Exactly. So it's like very, very powerful to do this as a habit every day, and I've been doing this for many years, and this had, you know, filled up my gratitude muscle yeah quite a bit so even when we you know we got hacked at maxi and and you know this was like super stressful but it was like actually fairly easy to go through because you know i, I worked out the scratch hoop muscles so much so i i'm, I'm I, I did not stress out at all and um especially when you're in a leadership position it's important when there's rough sea that you kind of keep calm and stare the ship through the water and not flip out because otherwise your entire team flips out as well. Yeah, that's that's going to be that's going to be a lot worse if you're uh, running around like crazy uh, instead of keeping a calm head and looking at the things that need to be done as next actions in in yep. this process. Yeah. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I, I that that's something that uh, I've noticed as well. Uh, I I didn't have the the those kind of uh, big problems yet, but uh, I, uh, I hope I, you won't have them because I really, really, really hope <laughs> <laughs> I really hope I don't. But uh, but uh, of course, uh, uh, coming from a system engineering background, there's always something that can go wrong, right? Uh, something yeah. goes down or whatever, and a lot of people stress out about that, like oh, it, the website is down and uh, stuff like that. And I'm thinking like, okay, I need to look at what the next steps are to debug why this is happening. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I need to be calm and think about that instead of just thinking, oh, the website is down we're losing a lot of money for example if it's a retail site or whatever uh and that's that's the thing yeah that makes sense uh okay so i have one more question to wrap up sure. uh so well, looking at this whole journey that you went through uh, with max cdn and all the companies that uh, you're involved in right now um if you look back what are what is kind of the most the thing that you're most proud of since starting on this whole journey Mm. I'm not sure if I'm if proud is the right word. I, I, I usually I, it's not big in my vocabulary. I, I think I never said like, "Oh, I'm proud of this. Or I'm proud of that." Um, I'm I'm more like I'm, I'm grateful that I have all these experiences that allow me to continuously grow and evolve. I think that's 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 the main thing. But with, with pride, I'm not not big on pride. Sorry. <laughs> it's no problem. <laughs> I, you could rephrase it the way you want to, but it it, it yeah. I, I can I can imagine that that's of course one of the things. Uh, that, and the 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 pride thing is is a is a good point as well. Where uh, yeah, it, it's it's um 
it might sometimes impl- it kind of implies something that isn't there right right i mean it's mm. not uh, that you're pride sometimes uh, is kind of close to arrogance in some cases some people will say <laughs> uh, so yeah, or, or, or i'm proud to be german like i didn't do anything i was just like born there <laughs> you were born that way yeah, not, not, that not, my, not my no my thing uh had no no input into this yeah i think the what what i'm really i'm really grateful for my wife that she is so supportive in helping me to doing all the stuff that i'm doing and um keeping my back free and she's a really good sounding board and i think it's really important that you choose the right partners in business and also in in your life that you Mm -hmm. have somebody who's you know i'm I'm a firm believer in iron sharpens iron you know if if your iron and your partner is wood you always cut through the wood and you get dull at some point but if you're both iron, you kind of keep it each other sharp, and um, you kind of grow. You know, if, if you have a business partner who always says yes to everything you come up with, then you know you don't really need a business partner. So I, I like being challenged. Yeah, I think this helps tremendously with growth. So yeah, that makes sense. Well, I usually don't that doesn't listen to this these these type of things, but. I'm I'm really really grateful for you, honey. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I I I I totally agree. Uh, it's a good analogy. I didn't think about that one uh, yet, but uh, that's that's some someone uh, some analogy that I'm going to keep in. <laughs> uh, so, uh, David, thank you a lot for uh, for the podcast. Uh, it was uh, it was great talking to you. Um, how can uh, people find you on the internet? Um, you can find me on, you can, if you want to email me, you can email me at david at or, you know, the, the usual social media things like Twitter and, and Facebook. You can just like add me. For sure. And hit okay. me up. Thank you, uh, David, again. And uh, for the listeners, uh, you can find the Bits vs. Byte podcast on uh, bitsvsbytes.com uh, and, of course, on uh, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. It's all Bits vs. Bytes. And uh, if you haven't already uh, subscribed to the newsletter, uh, there's a newsletter every two weeks with uh, five things about technology, business, and leadership. And uh, I'm going to thank you for listening and uh, until next time. Bye.